Hello, everyone. In this lecture podcast, I talk about international humanitarian law. And this is uh, Dr. Manjo Eisen preparing a lecture podcast for the unit in Laws 12070 on public international and human rights law. Um, as all of us are likely to be aware, there's still a lot of armed conflict and wars going on, even today. And we would have thought that they would have stopped after the Second World War when millions of individuals, both soldiers and civilians, died. Um, after the Vietnam War, hundreds of thousands of again, soldiers and civilians died during the Korean War. And so we would have thought that, you know, those eras when there was a lot of armed conflict and wars going on and stopped, but they continue even today. And you can see this obviously in countries ravaged by war in, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, in uh, places in Somalia, in Kenya, and so on. So the armed conflict go, uh, you know, armed conflicts go on. Now, unlike in the past, where armed conflicts typically involved the soldiers of warring states, it becomes more complicated today because there is also armed conflict in um, the territories of sovereign states. So you could have a local armed rebellion going on. In, you see this in places such as the Philippines. Um, you saw this in Sri Lanka. And you see this in Syria and so on. So there is, uh, they could, you could you speak of uh, armed conflict as a result of an internal strife, uh, mainly done by local armed groups who perhaps wish to uh, create a state of their own. And you see this happening as well in, in Turkey, where you have the, the, uh, you have the, uh, the Kurds. And um, we know this is problematic because uh, there was a decision on the part of the United States of American President Donald Trump, who decided that uh, the United States uh, military was going to withdraw from Syria. And, uh, and in doing so, it would mean that the protection that the United States of America traditionally uh, had long given to the Syrian Kurds, who, were, who are considered a terrorist group, but, but to some are in fact a, a rebel group trying to overturn uh, the Turkish government, or at the very least, a desirous uh, a group of people who desire to form an independent state, uh, with the withdrawal of the United States of America uh, military would have mean it would have meant that it would have been easy. It would be much easier for the Turkish government to to repel the rebellion and um, you know capture a lot of the, of these soldiers. And as a result, we've read in the news a, a plan on the part of the Syrian Kurds to try to ally. Uh, with the uh, repressive government of Bashir Assad in Syria. So th that's one aspect. So unlike in the past, uh, when you sp spoke of armed conflicts and wars, they would involve soldiers of warring states. Today, we speak of armed rebellions. Uh, we can also, in the past, have also seen instances when uh, rebel groups uh, would, be, uh, would seek to overturn a, a sovereign government uh, upon the behest of another um, independent state. So you, you can see this in the case of uh, Nicaragua, for example, in the 1980s, where the, the Contra rebel group was heavily funded by the United States government and it was trying to overturn the Sandinista Nicaraguan regime. And um, these types of, uh, of, you know, kind of armed conflicts go on in various parts of the world. A third aspect that is quite new, uh, which we didn't see in the World War II, would be the case of terror groups. Uh, you speak, for example, of uh, Al-Qaeda, which had been responsible, at least through uh, the declaration of Osama bin Laden, for uh, the, the devastating attack on uh, the United States during 9-1-1, when hundreds of thousands, if I'm not mistaken, of Americans uh, had died as a result of uh, two two airplanes that had crashed to the, uh, into the Twin Towers. And so even today, you see the uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and ISIL operating in various parts of the world. And the relevant question that we always ask is that if there is an armed conflict, and it is, you know, it's difficult to speak of a war, because usually, usually when you speak of a war, you speak of an armed conflict between two warring states. And using the term uh, armed conflict, when you speak of armed conflict uh, as a result of a, a conflict with a local rebel group, 
or an armed, or an, an armed conflict as a result of you know terrorist groups operating within within states such as in Indonesia. The, the relevant question to be asked is: Does international humanitarian law apply? And we know as well that there are. Uh, current concerns in the international arena as a result of, for example, in Australia, we've got problems with the boat refugees, and um, these boat refugees are, are, uh, fake, you know, are, are escaping persecution and deaths in some repressive regimes. Some come, from, some come from Syria, some come from Afghanistan, others come from Iran, and uh, from other African countries as well. And when we speak of you know, Australia trying to be humanitarian. Does Australia have an obligation under international humanitarian law to try to deal humanely with these uh, refugees? And the same question can be asked with the, with the Central American uh, refugees who have traveled from Honduras, from Uruguay, Paraguay, and trying to, you know, they've crossed Mexico in the past few months and they're trying to enter the United States of America. Does the United States uh, of America, as well as Mexico and other uh, countries or states, have an obligation under international humanitarian law to deal in a humane manner with, with these refugees? Because we've also seen it happen in, in Europe when uh, a lot of these uh, refugees sought to cross over to Europe from Iran, from Syria, from Iraq, trying to go into, get into Greece, perhaps into Turkey, again, trying to flee uh, repression or deaths or, you know, the the slow death as a result of a lack of food in, um, in these war-torn countries. And so this raises the question, what exactly is international humanitarian law? What exactly is the content of international humanitarian law and when does it apply? So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the principles of international humanitarian law and the key provisions of the Geneva Conventions relating to armed conflict. And we begin a discussion or this lecture podcast about international humanitarian law by pondering about some questions. So the first question we could probably ask is that if you re recall during the Iraq Gulf War, the Iraqi regime of the late Saddam Hussein would often display prisoners of war on television in a humil hum humiliating way. And uh, these soldiers, American soldiers more often than not, would then be made to confess to crimes or criticize their own government. This also happened, obviously, uh, in, during the Vietnam War. But of course, you know, you didn't have television then, you didn't have the internet then. But today, uh, it becomes more frequent because of the presence of social media and the presence of the internet. And the question that rises, that rises then would be, um, if, if this were to happen today, or when it happened, for example, did these constitute a breach of international humanitarian law? to be parading these prisoners of war, you know, uh, removing their clothes and humiliating them in, in many ways, would that, agree, would that be a breach of international humanitarian law? And in addition, we could also ask, again, we've seen instances when ISIS, ISIL, and Al-Qaeda, and when you speak of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and ISIL, for those of you who are unfamiliar with these groups, they've largely been, op been operating in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq, and in Syria. And you know they're trying to uh, establish their own caliphate state, and um, we've, in, in many instances, what they've done would be that you know they've had prisoners, they've captured uh, certain individuals, whether soldiers or civilians, and subjected the civilians or prisoners or soldiers uh, to humiliation, and in many cases they would be, uh, engage in beheading of these individuals, and the question arises. Uh, whether you know um, the ISIS and ISIL would violate international humanitarian law by doing these things, and that raises essentially the question of whether or not international humanitarian law applies to these groups, some of whom are uh, in, a, in a shorthand manner uh, referred to them as uh, international terror groups. The other question that we ask is. Can prisoners of war be tortured or coerced, perhaps by using waterboarding or using electric shocks in order to secure military information that they might possess? And what if, what if the torture or coercion is done upon terrorists or local armed rebels? Would those violate international 
humanitarian law. Think about those, right? Because these seem to continue to go on. We should also be asking ourselves, we know, for example, that the United States of America, through its Central Intelligence Agency operatives, are alleged to have tortured many al alleged Al-Qaeda terrorists and jihadist prisoners in, um, in Cuba and other uh, military installations of the United States in order to secure information about them, uh, for, from them about the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden and his top lieutenants, as well as about the plans of Al-Qaeda. And the question is, in doing so, in um, engaging in torture or, or humiliating uh, behavior towards uh, these prisoners, did the United States breach international humanitarian law in using torture and de degrading punishment? Because you recall there were pictures uh, spread in the past where uh, these prisoners, presumably Al-Qaeda al al terrorists and jihadist prisoners, were you know, made to wear dog collars and made to uh, walk around on the ground uh, on their knees and on their hands trying to be like dogs and you know they were made to do a lot of humiliating and degrading activities and the question is in doing so did the United States of America breach international humanitarian law and would international humanitarian law uh, cover uh, you know uh, activities involving torture in other words would torture be prohibited under international humanitarian laws, or is torture a separate category of its own? And so we examine these, uh, these questions as well in this lecture podcast. And we know as well that uh, in Syria, uh, there have been instances, this has happened in Iraq, where the, um, where the government itself would seek to, uh, to kill its own people by you know, dropping bombs. Or it could be that in the process of trying to you know, defend its own territory against rebels. You know, civilians become the, the largest casualties because they are unable to secure food. They're locked out in, in a, in a war-torn uh, area. And the, the question that arises is, does the Geneva Convention, for example, uh, which it codifies mainly international customary law, would it impose a legal obligation on a state to protect its own nationals in case there is a, a war and how, how about if the war or, or the armed conflict is against local rebel groups, or it could be against terror, terror groups such as ISIS and ISIL? And I had raised the question before, does international humanitarian law impose a legal obligation on states such as Australia to act humanely towards both refugees and political refugees? And finally, the other question we ask is, would terrorists and local, local rebels, if they are captured, should they be treated as prisoners of war under international humanitarian law? And so these are the questions and concepts that we will uncover uh, and examine more deeply in the course of this lecture podcast. So let's begin by looking at the historical development of international humanitarian law. And we know that international humanitarian law large, largely emerged as a result of the wars and the armed conflict that have happened in the past. And the more recent ones would be World War II and World War I. But before then, of course, we know that there had, they had, there had been wars uh, and armed conflict, for example, between the United States and uh, the UK, uh, you know, the War of Independence in America. And you've had uh, conflicts, let's say, between the U Britain and France and versus Spain. In the 1500s, there were wars going on between Spain and Portugal and so on. So, you know, it would appear that uh, one very frequent theme in uh, world history has been wars. And as a result, uh, especially in the 1800s, with the devastation of wars, with prisoners, you know, prisoners of war, with soldiers being wounded in the battlefield, especially during World War I, if you recall, you know, the landmines, which were crippled uh, soldiers. And the question was, is there an obligation to try to be humanely with those who are wounded in the event of war? And so through time, uh, as we see, um, international human law emerged mainly as you know, part of the laws of war, the laws of armed conflict, and eventually, it is more commonly known as international humanitarian law. And mainly because uh, we know now that uh, when you speak of international humanitarian law, oftentimes it is associated with humanitarian purposes and relief work. Now, so in other words, when you speak of 
when you spoke of laws of war and laws of armed conflict, you usually talk about laws that regulated the behavior of uh, warring states. But today, uh, especially after World War I, we know that a lot of the international humanitarian law uh, is also a result of involvement of non-states, such as the Red Cross, the International Red Cross. Is that the name? Is it IRC or is it International Order of the Red Cross? And they are involved in hum humanitarian purposes and relief work. You can also see uh, international humanitarian uh, work uh, done by agencies of the United Nations and a lot of other um, non non-profit organizations. So the shift towards the, the idea of an international humanitarian law, as opposed to the laws of war and laws of armed conflict, have largely been uh, a result of the fact that uh, when you speak of laws of war and laws of armed conflict, you're essentially just focusing on the, the conflict and the war and the, you know, the involvement of the military. When in fact, a lot of uh, international humanitarian law does not involve uh, combatants, but uh, you know, non-combatants as, as well, and those which are not state entities, as, as I said, such as the UN and the Red Cross. So, let's begin with a uh, definition of international uh, humanitarian law, and we're going to be examining the, the four Geneva Conventions in a short while. And one of the more helpful definitions of international humanitarian law uh, was proposed by Sandoz, Swinarski, and Zimmerman, and they said that international humanitarian law uh, can be defined as uh, the set of international rules established by treaties or custom, which are specifically intended to solve humanitarian problems directly arising from international or non-international armed conflicts. So, so it has to be an armed conflict, but the armed conflict can be international. It can also be non-international, meaning it can be a domestic armed conflict and which for humanitarian reasons limit the right of parties to a conflict to use the methods and means of warfare of their choice or protect persons and property that are or may be affected by conflict. So because of, because of humanitarian reasons, international human, humanitarian law imposes obligations on parties to a conflict to make sure that you know, there are certain means and methods of war so it's not like um, just because there's a war going on, you know, there are simply no rules. It's like, you know, uh, it becomes the law of the jungle. That is not so. Uh, you might say that uh, wars are meant to be humane. If you can say, you know, could there be such a thing? Um, so you have wars, but the rules involve a war. Interesting, isn't it? Because he would have thought that, you know, the mere fact that you want to kill somebody means that because you're at war, there shouldn't be any rules, but there are rules not only involving the soldiers, but also civilians, you know, the, the, the non-combatants. So that's a definition, definition of international humanitarian law. And we will examine uh, in greater de detail in a short while that aspect about international humanitarian law involving, you know, even non-international armed conflict. That aspect about the non-international armed conflict becomes... Um, Quite difficult when you speak, or it's a complex issue, especially when you deal with local armed rebel groups. Because the question that arises is if there is a, re a local a domestic rebellion going on and you have an armed rebel group, as a result of that, you know, armed strife, that you know, that armed conflict happening domestically, would, they, would international humanitarian law apply? But that becomes very curious because when you speak of international humanitarian law, traditionally, the, the traditional, as we know, the traditional subjects of international law are states. So if you're dealing with a rebel group, how exactly do you impose international humanitarian law when you're dealing with, with rebel groups? Whereas, you know, if you speak of a state entity, especially if that state entity is a member of the United Nations, then it's possible to, you know, file the appropriate uh, complaint uh, in the United Nations. But if you're dealing with uh, a, a local armed rebel group, they don't have any representation in the United Nations. How exactly then do you police the issue about um, an international armed conflict? And it's something we will delve deeper in a short while. So let's begin with the idea of international humanitarian law, which, which involves a war or an armed conflict. This isn't uh, very complicated. So the Geneva Conventions, as I said, there are four of them, which we take up in a short while, yes. Um, 
They apply to all cases of declared war or any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. So what we should notice is that uh, the, the four Geneva Conventions were entered into and signed by you know, the high contracting parties. The high contracting parties could only be states because you know, they're the only subjects, they're the primary subjects of international law. So you can't have a rebel group uh, becoming a uh, signatory to the Geneva Conventions, not even then. So uh, that should be quite clear. Uh, the Geneva Conventions, uh, the main subjects of the Geneva Conventions and, of a main, and who have a main obligation under international law, or particularly under international humanitarian law, would be states. And we now know that these are the Geneva Conventions as well. Uh, the, Geneva, the Geneva Conventions will apply even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. So for as long as there is a declared war or if there is any other armed conflict between states, then the Geneva Conventions will apply. And we examine in a short while the content of the Geneva Conventions. So the reference by Sandoz, Winarski, and Zimmerman earlier that international humanitarian law uh, also involves armed conflicts instead of war, uh, can be said to be more correct because it is possible for a state, for example, to argue that it is not uh, engaging in a war against uh, or with another state, but it may be involved in an armed conflict by committing certain hostile acts. Uh, one, for example, by engaging, because you know another state can say, oh, we're just engaging in police action or a legitimate act of self-defense. So remember, uh, the United States, in a sense, invaded Panama when they tried, when the United States sought to capture Manuel Noriega in the 1990s. And the United States can just claim that it was engaged in police action or legitimate self-defense. And so it wasn't really at war. But uh, when you think about it, the question then is, you know, was the United States at that point involved in an armed conflict with um, with Panama, I mean, that particular case, would, it, would international humanitarian law apply? It can also be that uh, when you speak of, um, of uh, you know, of an armed conflict, what we need to remember is that armed conflict doesn't really mean that, you know, two states through their soldiers are shooting at each other, as we later, as we see later on, the case of persecutor versus um, Tadic, the case uh, decided in the international criminal tribunal established by uh, the United Nations Security Council. So you can have an armed conflict short of, you know, shooting match. It could be, as we saw in the case of the United States of America versus Nicaragua, it can be uh, involving logistics, you know, supplying arms, supplying weapons, even supplying what, medicines and food in order to aid a, a particular armed group. There will still be armed conflict in that, say, in that sense. And so, uh, when you speak of international humanitarian law, it governs and regulates the conduct of armed combatants in an armed conflict, particularly in relation to how civilians, prisoners of war, the sick, and the wounded should be treated in an armed conflict. So the focus of the reason why we have international humanitarian law is mainly to safeguard the interests of civilians, prisoners of war, the sick, and the wounded, how they are to be treated in an armed conflict. Conflict. So even if um, you know you, you may have a soldier of an enemy state that has been captured, just because that particular enemy soldier, pre, uh, you know, previously had uh, been responsible for the deaths of um, some civilians in your state or even your fellow soldiers, doesn't mean that you know you can just uh, you call it, you know just kill that that um, that prisoner of war. There are laws of war or what we call international humanitarian law. So, as I mentioned, there are four, the, the main basis of, um, of international humanitarian law, the main basis have been the four Geneva Conventions. So the first Geneva Convention of 1864, it was about the, it is the convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded in armies in the field. So it's the references in the field, because all the way up to World War I in particular, there would be a lot of, um, wounded soldiers in the field and the question is what do you do with them and of course that doesn't really happen today because you know when you bomb you know a, a lot of the a lot of the wars now or armed conflicts are done not through the you know soldiers shooting at each other but it's essentially through guided weapons but in 1864 
there was the question of what do you do with, with armies or soldiers who are wounded in the battlefield. And so they had to come up with the Geneva Convention of 1864. And then there was the second Geneva Convention in 1906, which relates to the conditions of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea. Again, you'll notice a, a development in uh, the modes of war. So whereas wars before used to be fought only in the field, mainly, then you had to come up with a convention when there are wars at sea, you know, between ships or battleships. And then uh, you had the third Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war. So not a, because you can have a prisoner of war who hasn't really been wounded. And so now there is a, an attempt to regulate the, the way that prisoners of war are to be treated as of 1949. And then you had the fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in times of war, which I've said. The bigger casualty during wars have not really been soldiers, but civilians, especially today. Civilians who go hungry, who are famished, who die from hunger because they lack access to food, they lack, ac they lack access to proper shelter, and they lack access to proper medicine. Uh, and you see this in a lot of the war-torn countries in Syria and Iraq. And Afghanistan. But in addition to the four Geneva Conventions, a parallel development in the in international humanitarian law has really been uh, other treaties which have been entered into uh, on the same subject about you know governing wars and armed conflict. You had the Paris Conference in 1856 and there was also the first Hague Peace Conference in 1899 and the second Hague Peace Conference in 1907. And as a result, with the confluence of uh, these treaties and international peace conferences, as well as the Geneva Convention, we now arrive at international humanitarian law, which is both a result of conventional or treaty law, as well as post-Sumerian international law. So in other words, a lot of um, the content of treaties have now become post-Sumerian international law, which means that international humanitarian law becomes binding even upon states that are not signatories to the original Geneva Conventions. Because we recall that the last Geneva Convention was signed in 1949. You had a lot of states that emerged after the 1950s and emerged especially in the 1990s with the breakup of the United Soviet of Socialist Republic, USSR, as well as in Hungary and Yugoslavia. And they wouldn't have been signatories or parties to the Geneva Conventions. And so the question would have arisen if these new states uh, refuse to sign the convention, does it mean that um, convention on, on prisoners of war and you know, treatment of civilians during war, if they do not sign uh, these particular conventions, does it mean that they are no longer covered by international humanitarian law? And the answer is no, because as we now know, international humanitarian law is largely post American international law as well. So, um, when you talk about international humanitarian law, international humanitarian law applies to international and non-international armed conflicts. So it has to be, in, it has to involve armed conflicts, but it does not apply to armed conflict that cannot be classified as international or non-international. We're going to see this uh, more clearly in a short while. And the relevant question that should be asked would be if international humanitarian law would apply to terror, terror, terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and ISIL. Would it? What do you think? Now, would international humanitarian law apply to local rebel groups as well, trying to overturn an existing government? So you've seen that um, there, is a, uh, there is a local rebel group or several local rebel groups in Syria. There's also a local rebel group operating in the Philippines. In fact, a lot of them. And the question is, would international humanitarian law apply? Uh, in relation to these armed conflicts with local rebel groups and terrorist groups. Think about that. You'd like to know, right? So let's, let's move on. So questions to ponder. Uh, we've asked that question, so we'll skip that question. I'm just repeating the same questions which I posed earlier. So there are at least four key concepts we should be examining when we speak about international humanitarian law. One, we look at armed conflict. We try to define it better, following the case of um, prosecutor versus Panich. As I said, a case is uh, by the International Criminal Tribunal, created by the United Nations Security Council. 
The other, uh, the other concept we need to examine would be the concept of international armed conflict. There's also the non-international armed conflict and other armed conflicts that cannot be classified as international or non-international. But at its very core, for international humanitarian law to apply, there has to be an armed conflict. But then again, you know, that leads to the question. Uh, a lot of the refugees coming to Australia, the boat refugees, a lot of refugees going to uh, countries such as Greece in, in Europe, or even the refugees going to the United States through Mexico, coming from Guatemala, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Uh, these can be said to be refugees or fleeing, fleeing war. And the question that arises then would be, does international humanitarian law apply to the states uh, to which these refugees from war-torn countries are trying to, to flee to? So let's think about that as well. Now, so uh, in the case of prosecutor versus Stalich, uh, the International Criminal Court decided that an armed conflict exists whenever there is a resort to armed force between states. So that's the conventional way, but there can also be a, a, um, an armed conflict involving protected, protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organized armed groups or between such groups within a state. So when you have a, when you examine, uh, you know, Bosnia-Herzegovina in the 1990s, the Balkan Wars, you examine Syria, you examine, you, you look at Iraq, probably not Afghanistan. You will notice that there are armed groups operating within these states. They're battling the, the legitimate, or let's call it the legal government, and sometimes they're battling each other, which is happening in Syria. And we know that there is armed conflict. There, obviously, there's an armed conflict going on, but the question is, does international humanitarian law apply? And the answer is yes, uh, it does. International humanitarian law applies in these specific instances. But of course, we ask the question, would it apply to, uh, you know, to wars or armed conflicts against, uh, you know, between a, a government and a local rebel group? Would it apply uh, in, a, in an armed conflict between a government and terrorist groups? And we're going to get there in a short while, but I'm saying, you know, you have to be clear that there is, in fact, a distinction which I will not preempt in a short while, but we will get there in a short while. Now, again, following the case of um, United States of America versus Nicaragua, which is cited in this case, armed force doesn't just involve, you know, the conventional armed force, which is by weapons or non-conventional weapons, such as chemical weapons. You can also have um, armed force involving the use of um, armies or small scale, such as the use of groups, there can be an armed force in that particular case. You can also have uh, armed force in the sense of, as I mentioned, the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America, of um, one government supplying an armed group with not necessarily you know, weapons of war, but could be providing military advice, advice logistics, the helicopters, and so on, which I think is being done uh, in, in, in Syria and Afghanistan that will still be uh, covered by the definition of armed force and therefore covered by international humanitarian law uh, uh, in relation to the idea of armed conflict. So, does international humanitarian law apply? The armed conflict can be between states, and we know international humanitarian law would apply. And how about governmental authorities and organized armed groups, such as the Syrian government and Syrian rebel groups? Um, in that particular case, we're going to get into details in a short while. Um, it can apply uh, following the case of prosecutor versus Stalic. The, the basic question is, you know, what kind of armed conflict is going on and what is the nature of the, of the rebel group? Would it apply uh, to organized armed groups in general, such as rebel groups that are fighting each other, which is happening in Iraq, Libya, and various African war torn states? So you have a lot of rebel groups that are actually fighting against each other. And although they're fighting against each other, they seem to have a common bond because they're trying to overturn a legal government. So the question is, does international humanitarian law apply? And we're going to look into this in a short while when you look at inter non-international armed conflict. So I'm going to leave you in suspense 
for the moment. And so you can also have an armed conflict involving a state and terror groups such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and ISIL. And again, that raises the question, uh, in that war of a state against a terror group, would international humanitarian law apply? What do you think? Mm. Let's examine that uh, shortly. So again, uh, at its core, it's easy to understand that international humanitarian law largely governs uh, international armed conflicts. And we see this, for example, in, our, in um, Article 2, which is common among the four Geneva Conventions. But in particular, the 1949 Geneva Convention provides that there is an international armed conflict in all cases of declared war or any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. So um, it could be that um, you will notice in, in World War II, for example, the, the German, the Nazi government and its, uh, you know, the Nazi army was just able to enter uh, countries such as Italy and even France without much resistance. The question is, would there be an international armed conflict in that sense? The answer is still yes, because even if there is no armed resistance, you can still have an armed conflict as um, stated in the 1949 Geneva Convention, for example, Common Article 2. So it is very clear that from the definition that when you speak of an international armed conflict, it has to be between states, and mainly because only states can be high contracting parties to the conventions. But when you think about it, on the one hand, you ask whether states have an obligation to obey international humanitarian law. But how about... Uh, when you speak of, um, when you speak of, uh, you know, when you speak of um, rebel groups that are trying to overturn a government, would they be, uh, or even terror groups, do they have an obligation to, to obey international humanitarian law? If you look at the case of prosecutor versus Tadish, the answer is yes. If there is an, an armed conflict, both international and non-international, you can have, um, it is possible to have, uh, uh, it is possible to have uh, international and military law uh, governing in that particular instance. So where are we now? So let's look at non-international armed conflict. So um, let's talk about non-international armed conflict. So obviously you can have an armed conflict that is non-international. In other words, it's happening mainly in the borders of a particular state. And we will observe again that um, common Article 3, so when I say common, it's an article that's common across the Portland Geneva Conventions. So um, common uh, Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions defines non-international armed conflict as an armed conflict, not of an international character, occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties. So again, you know, no, no, nothing uh, difficult about that. And uh, the additional protocol two in 1977 expanded on what comprises a non-international armed conflict. Article one, paragraph one provides that common article three of the Geneva Convention applies to all armed conflicts which take place in the territory of a high contracting party between its armed forces and dissident armed forces or other organized groups which under responsible command exercise such control over a part of his territory as to enable them to carry out sustained concern military operations and to implement this protocol. So, although the Geneva Conventions largely govern the conduct and impose obligations on states, we now know that the international, the international humanitarian law, as found in the four Geneva Conventions, can also apply to dissident armed forces and other organized armed groups for as long as there is a they are under a responsible command they exercise such control over a part of his territory as to enable them to carry out sustained concerted military operations and to implement this protocol which brings that question about local rebel groups operating in syria local rebel groups operating for example in the philippines and as i said uh, you know perhaps um, if you have a, a local 
dissident armed force or organized armed group that is able to control a territory, which we examine in greater detail, international humanitarian law can apply. Because that's what happened during the Balkan Wars. In the case of uh, Prosecutor versus Tadic, what had essentially happened was that there had been uh, Bosnian, you know, there was the so-called the Bosnian army, and you had a lot of uh, organized armed groups. They committed genocide, they committed war crimes, and so on. They did not treat prisoners of war humanely. They did not treat wounded soldiers humanely. They did not treat civilians humanely. In fact, uh, civilians were often, especially the women, were often raped, including young children. And uh, the issue in the case of a prosecutor versus uh, Tadic, the International Criminal Tribunal, tribunal um, set up by the United Nations Security Council, was whether or not international humanitarian law applied to the organized armed groups such as those of which uh, Tanich was part of. The answer was yes. Okay, but as we see shortly, and let's see if I should be emptying the question, uh, we, we ask whether or not international humanitarian law applies always in the event of a non conflict, for example, involving a rebel group, such as, um, you know, in, in the Philippines, there is a local armed rebel group there known as the National People's Army. You can have a local armed rebel group again in some other states. The question is does international humanitarian law apply? And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you in suspense for the moment. We're going to get back to that in a short while. So, from Pictet, uh, one of the foremost authors on um, and authorities on international humanitarian law, there can be a non international, so meaning domestic armed conflict, when there is a dissident armed force or other organized armed groups, when the insurgents of an organization prefer to have the characteristics of a state. So, it is crucial for international humanitarian law to govern the conduct of these dissident armed forces or these organized armed groups, international humanitarian law will only apply if these insurgents of an organization perverting to the characteristics of a state. So in that case, ISIL, for example, in Syria, because it purports to be a state, a caliphate state, then international humanitarian law will apply. But if you have a smaller rebel group, international humanitarian law will not apply because these you know some of these smaller rebel groups don't really uh, attempt to to say that they are states and in addition uh, the insurgent civil authority exercises de facto authority over persons within a determinate portion of the national territory this had happened in afghanistan before where the taliban controlled a large part of afghanistan even if there was another uh, you know a, le a legitimate afghanistan government it's probably happening in other parts of maybe Iraq. So the insurgents are trying to act like a state. They also exercise uh, de facto authority. And the armed forces, their armed forces act under the direction of an organized authority and are prepared to observe the ordinary laws of war. So because they have an armed force, you know, they're, they're not states yet, but actually they are acting like you know, uh, armies of particular states. And as well, the insurgency of authority agrees to be bound by the provisions of the convention. And uh, the above criteria also useful as a means of distinguishing a genuine armed conflict from a mere act of banditry or an unorganized and short-lived insurrection. Because you can have, you know, uh, banditry in the sense that, you know, you can have a small group just trying to uh, in, uh, engage in guerrilla warfare that will not involve um, international humanitarian law. Now, this, this aspect about the, the, the requirement that the civil authority must agree, the insurgent civil authority, the rebel civil authority must agree to be bound by the provisions of the convention, that's very curious because if you, and of course he wrote this in 1958, and that's probably no longer the case because if you examine the case of prosecutor versus Tadic, Tadic and the uh, Boston rebel group or Bosnian army that had committed genocide uh, at that time. Obviously, they did not wish to be bound by the provisions of the Geneva Conventions. They felt that they were outside inter human, international humanitarian law. Uh, but uh, the court ruled, the International Criminal Court ruled that even if they did not consent to it, because it is international customary law, it binds them as well, notwithstanding uh, the failure to consent because the, the, the banning character of international humanitarian law in that sense did not rest on the four Geneva Conventions but on the character of international humanitarian law as customary international law. 
So, uh, you know, the other question we have is, let me go back to, yep, yeah, go back to the question shortly. So, does international humanitarian law apply to terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or ISIL? That's the first question that we should be asking ourselves. And hopefully you're familiar with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and ISIL. Now, how do these, of course, you know, they're being labeled as terrorist groups. Of course, they don't label themselves as such. But for the moment, let's just accept that they're called terrorist groups. And the question is, will these terrorist groups uh, be covered by uh, international humanitarian law? Remember, international humanitarian law works both ways. It works on the state, which deals with terrorist groups to ensure that the state obeys international humanitarian law. It also works in the sense that the armed dissident group would also be bound by international humanitarian law, as such as in the case of uh, prosecutor versus studies. So that if they violate international humanitarian law, then there can be uh, penalties in the form of imprisonment, which is what happened to, to Tadic. So would terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or ISIL uh, be covered by international humanitarian law? Think about it. And the answer would be, where do they operate? The difference between local rebel groups and terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS and ISIL is that these terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and ISIL, do not, do not operate largely within a, a particular territory. In fact, Al-Qaeda attacks the United States, attacks you know, the UK, attacks Belgium, and so on. Same thing with ISIS and ISIL. And so therefore, in that sense, international humanitarian law does not apply. So these terrorist groups are not bound by international humanitarian law and they do not have the protection of international humanitarian law which leads to the question of whether torture and waterboarding would be then permissible if international humanitarian law does not cover uh, these terrorist groups we're going to get back to that in a short while now one thing we need to remember is that um, at its core uh, international law rests on the consent of states. And so, to an extent, therefore, the moment a state uh, imposes obligations upon itself, such as, for example, agreeing you know, or consenting to international law applying in a particular, in a particular state, to an extent, there is, there is a derogation of state sovereignty. And we know that when you speak of state sovereignty, it means that the state is meant to be supreme within its own territory. It doesn't, you know, a state doesn't report to the United Nations, doesn't report to the United Nations Security Council. Well, but with the application of international law, there is the understanding that international law applies to a state. So to that extent, it seems to be a derogation of state sovereignty. But the answer is really no, because uh, for two reasons. One is, in many cases, international law applies upon the consent of a state. So it could be because the state consents through, through treaty or conventions, or state consents through international, also many international law, meaning consistent state practice, considered as, uh, with opinion units, considered as um, binding upon states. But at the same time, there are certain uh, norms of international, parameter norms of international law that are binding upon all states as, you know, as laws of humanity. So when you speak of piracy, when you speak of child labor, prohibitions against child labor, when you speak of prohibitions against genocide and international war crimes, these particular prohibited acts in international law are binding upon states even in the absence of their consent because that's the nature of international law. There are just certain peremptory norms or use cogent norms that are binding upon states even in the absence of their consent. Okay? But in general, therefore, when you speak of uh, you know, the application of international humanitarian law, what actually happens is, to a great extent, a derogation or a limitation of state sovereignty. And we recall that under Article 2 of the United Nations Charter in Paragraph 1, the organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all, of all its members and that there is nothing contained in the present charter which shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. As I said, that is a crucial point because you can have a domestic strife. You can have, a, you can have an armed conflict within the state between a legal government and uh, an armed rebel group. And international humanitarian law, in the case of a non-international armed conflict, is meant to apply in that armed conflict between a sovereign state or a sovereign government and an armed rebel group. But 
Again, as we said, the states have largely allowed this by being signatories to the Geneva Conventions or two uh, because of the development of customary international law. As well, we look at Article 2, Paragraph 7 in the United Nations. It says that, but this principle shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures under Chapter 7. So in other words, states, when they became members of the United Nations, agreed that there is an entity such as the United Nations Security Council which can have enforcement measures, including the power of the United Nations Security Council to create international criminal tribunals. Okay, so questions to ponder. When um, the United States commits torture against al-Qaeda terrorists and jihadist prisoners, the question is, did it commit a breach of international humanitarian law in using torture? Did it? So before you answer the question, the, the basic question you need to ask is, does international humanitarian law apply in relation to al-Qaeda terrorists and jihadist prisoners? And the answer is no, because as we said, when you speak of these terrorist groups, they're not operating within a particular domestic territory. They're kind of international terrorists. So international humanitarian law will not apply. The question, however, about the use of torture is a, is a distinct question, which we examine in one of the slides shortly, because there is a convention against torture, which is separate from international humanitarian law, although very related, because when you have a requirement to treat civilians, when you have a requirement to treat prisoners of war, a requirement to treat uh, wounded soldiers humanely, obviously if you torture them, you cannot be treating them humanely. So there is a connection, uh, an overlap between international humanitarian law and torture, the you know, prohibition against torture. There's also an overlap actually between international humanitarian law and international human rights law. So there are certain uh, human rights which are meant to be non-derogable. So in other words, they're meant to be respected because they're certain, you know, they're part of the of what is a human being. There are certain uh, inviolable human rights, and including the right not to be tortured and not to be subjected to coercion. So there's an overlap, but we're not going to get into that in a short while. Oh, we're not going to get into that right now. Okay. Now the 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 second question we asked uh, was whether or not the Geneva Convention supports legal obligations of Sierra to protect its own nationals in the ongoing civil war. Aha. Uh -huh. That's tricky. So, there is an armed conflict in Syria. The question is, do the Geneva Conventions impose legal obligations? And the, the, the questions we need to ask is, does international humanitarian law apply? Is there an international armed conflict within Syria? It could, the answer is probably yes. Because you have, uh, you know, Russia, the United States, Australia perhaps, uh, the UK, uh, France, operating within Syria. So, there is an international armed conflict going on. For that reason, therefore, uh, the Geneva Conventions would apply, and even if there were no, if it was even if it were non-international, even if it were just local, if it was a non-international armed conflict. Had there been no other international participants, such as states, uh, that would have been a different question, uh, really. Okay, but the nature of the Syrian war is that you do have uh, an international armed conflict going on, with Russia being there, with Turkey being there, so the Arabia, even Australia, and so on. Now. How about, however, in relation, so because international humanitarian law applies, there is an obligation on the part of all the parties there, including the United States, Russia, and so on. The laws of war apply, so laws in relation to the treatment of prisoners of war, laws in relation to wounded soldiers, laws in relation to civilians, they apply. Now, how about in relation to serious war against local rebel groups, such as ISIS and ISIL, in relation to those uh, entities, international humanitarian law will not apply because these are not one considered to be, you know, uh, part of the definition of a an, an non-international armed conflict because they're operating mainly outside of, of, of Syria. They're using Syria as a base, but launching, you know, attacks outside of Syria. And what we need to remember as well is that when you speak of a non-international armed conflict, we did have, uh, you know, five uh, tributes which were crucial, four of them at least were crucial, which is that, you know, you had an insurgent civil, civil, civil uh, government, you had a, an armed group, there was a protracted armed conflict, and so on. So those are things you need to examine. So the, the, in relation to the question, does international humanitarian law apply in armed conflicts with local rebel groups? In general, the answer then is no. So you can only have international humanitarian law applying in armed conflicts with local rebel groups 
when the criteria of the armed conflict being a non-international armed conflict as you find that the, the foreign conventions would apply. And that is when you have an army, you have an insurgent uh, civil group uh, controlling a sizable territory and so on. So in general, therefore, if you're just dealing with a local rebel group, international humanitarian law will apply. And instead, what is crucial to remember is the idea of state sovereignty, so that it is up to the state to determine how it deals with its local rebel groups if it captures them, which can lead to the question, can a, you know, would, would a state be breaching international humanitarian law if it tortures local rebel groups? If it kills, you know, assume, assuming that a, a state government is then able to capture local rebels, would a state have the power to execute them straight away without subjecting them to, to trial? And the answer is mainly that there won't be a violation of international humanitarian law because international humanitarian law will not apply. Now, of course, it's a different thing altogether when you speak about international criminal law, which we should speak of next week, because when there is a commission of genocide, in other words, there is an attempt on the part of a state to try to exterminate you know, a, a class of persons, then that can be genocide. Or when you have um, international war crimes, such as the commission of uh, rape or executions uh, in a large scale or massive executions, you can have uh, an international war crimes coming in, which is a different scheme altogether. But if you're speaking of sporadic killings of local rebel re rebels, um, international humanitarian law will not apply, neither would international criminal law apply. And in that particular case, it's really up to the state to determine, based on the principle of sovereignty, to determine how it deals with its local rebel groups. Now, what we need to remember is that there is an international law on torture, but it's based on convention, it is uh, based on convention. So there is a convention against torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, commonly known as the United Nations Conventions Against Torture, which is an international human rights treaty effective as of 1987, that aims to prevent torture and other acts of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment around the world. There is no customary international law against torture, and we should remember that as far as this particular convention is concerned, because as we said, it is possible that international humanitarian law will not apply, such as when you have a non-international armed conflict, right? So you can have, you can have local rebels. Uh, they might be tortured by a state, correct? And international humanitarian law will not be there to govern because it's not covered under the definition of a non-international armed conflict. But will the rules on torture apply? The foremost question we ask is, the convention against torture will only apply if a state is a party to that particular convention. If it is not, the convention will not apply. But secondly, even if a state is a party to the convention against torture, you will notice that several states actually have made several reservations to, to, to that particular convention. The United States, for example, uh, has made a reservation that it is up to it to define what torture is. So there is a lot of legroom there as to the interpretation. So the United States is not bound by the, any official definition of torture. It can say, because for some, you know, when you, when you uh, subject a person to, uh, uh, to uh, solitary confinement, to in, being incommunicado, when you uh, subject a person to humiliation, when you subject a person to, uh, you know, not being able to sleep for so, for so many nights, to some that might be torture, to others, it might not be. At least that's the definition in the United States it would appear, because it's been doing that, we're seeing. So the, the international law of torture is based on convention or treaties. There is no customary international law against torture. So it's only those who are parties to the convention are bound by the convention, subject to any reservation that they may make. So uh, in terms of the scope, and we're heading toward the end of this uh, lecture podcast, the scope of protection under international humanitarian law, it protects the wounded and the sick who are members of the armed forces. It protects prisoners of war and civilians. And so in terms of the wounded and sick, uh, the first Geneva Convention, which called, concerns the wounded and sick on land, on land. So at that time, you didn't really have you know, air, warfare in the air or you know, in the sea. It requires the soldiers and organized militias who are wounded and sick, including those who are authorized to accompany them, shall be respected and protected in all circumstances. 
so that if they were to fall into enemy hands, the first Geneva Convention mandates that they should be treated humanely and given adequate care. So if you are sick, if you're a wounded soldier, you're sick, um, you still have to be treated humanely under the Geneva Convention. And killing of wounded or and sick soldiers who fall into the hands of the enemy is prohibited. And if you examine, another crucial point is that um, what do you do with spies? So during World War II, what had happened was that the Allies actually, you know, had spies, uh, you know, landing behind enemy lines in the same way that Germany presumably would have done so as well. They would have spies uh, operating uh, in, um, you know, in, in enemy territory. The question is, do, do the, does the Geneva Convention apply to, um, to spies? The thing is, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not really sure about this, but from, from one of my reading, um, I don't think it's been covered in the book, but spies are really not soldiers. And which is why if you watch a lot of movies and TV series, um, there is no protection for, for example, for people from the CIA because they can't be considered prisoners of war because they're not soldiers. They're not part of the armed forces. And so, um, in fact, in, in many countries, therefore, the mere fact that alone that somebody has been caught as a spy means that they'll be subjected to death by, by a state. So that's a problem there. So when you speak of the uh, Geneva Convention, we're dealing with soldiers, okay? And oftentimes, when you speak of soldiers, they're usually in uniform. So imagine that. You've got a war going on, but for you to be identified as a soldier, you need to be wearing proper uniform, right? Okay, and prisoners don't do that because I mean, not prisoners, spies don't do that because they're meant to you know, not appear to be, they're meant not to appear soldiers. At the same time, the second Geneva Convention in 1906 relates to the conditions of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of the armed forces at sea and is highly similar to the first Geneva Convention. Now, prisoners of war, the third Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war in 1949 focuses on prisoners of war and deals with the comprehensive code relating to the requirement that they be treated humanely in all circumstances. So out of the convention, a legal duties of the enemy state who captures POW to keep them alive and in good health. Does it mean that they need to be placed in a, in a, in a place with this conditioning? Probably not. It's just enough that they should be kept alive and in good health. So, but how about during the Vietnam War? Um, a lot of them were placed in bamboo cages there where there was water. At least that's what I saw in the movie Healing Fields. And The Deer Hunter, uh, starring Robert De Niro. Great movie. So POWs must always be treated humanely and protected, especially against acts of violence and intimidation. So you will recall that uh, at the start of the lecture podcast, I talked about Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein having captured some American soldiers, parading them on, on the streets of um, Baghdad and you know, tying something around them and humiliating them and so on. That would have been a breach of international humanitarian law. Now, reprisal measures against POWs are also outlawed, as well as insulting them and treating them as public curiosity. And as we said, our terrorists and like, so going back to the question, our terrorists and local groups or re local rebels have captured, are they treat to be treated as prisoners of war or international humanitarian law? The answer is no, because they don't, in general, they don't, they don't meet the requirements of being a non-international, of there being a non-international armed conflict. Now, civilians, uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, relative to the protection of civilian persons in times of war, provides a comprehensive set of rules for the protection of civilians in times of war. Now, remember, there are two types of civilians, civilians protected by the convention. Those who, at a given moment, and any manner whatsoever, find themselves in case of a conflict or occupation in the hands of a party to the conflict of which they are not nationals. So, you know, persons can be displaced or persons can be caught by, by enemies. And in that case, they will be civilians protected by the convention. But you can also have uh, civilians who find themselves in the hands of an occupying power which, of which they are not nationals. So, um, you might have an enemy state trying to enter, you know, invade a, a particular state, and you will have civilians who will fall in the hands of the occupying power. This happened a lot in World War II, involving Germany, 
uh, you know, entering France, entering to France, Austria, entering into, um, into uh, Italy, or in the case of Japan, entering, uh, you know, invading a lot of uh, countries in Asia, including the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Uh, in terms of the uh, protections, the protections under the convention, which protect the civilians and territories of the parties of the conflict and in occupied territories, include respect for fundamental rights, such as respect for the person, honor, family rights, religious convictions and practices, protection for women, protect prohibition against coercion, corporal punishment, and so on. So which leads to the question that the convention imposes legal obligations on Syria to protect its own nationals and the ongoing civil war, and the answer I think we said was yes, because there is an international armed conflict going on in Syria, mainly because of the involvement of Russia, Turkey, the United States, Australia, and a lot of other countries. So, uh, in this lecture podcast, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the principles of international humanitarian law and the key provisions of the Geneva Conventions relating to armed conflict. And we talked as well about Convention Against Torture. We talked as well about international criminal law and international human rights law. So thank you for listening to this podcast and I hope you enjoyed watching. Bye.